My name is Marin Brown, and I am an arts consultant from Massachusetts. I'm delighted to be here today as part of uh, this conference. And this session is called Forging and Sustaining Strategic Cross-Sector Partnerships. Um, I am going to be starting off by setting the context of partnerships between the arts and other sectors and communities. And this context is based on research that I conducted with other colleagues, including Tom Borup. So I was really surprised and delighted to see that Tom was here. Tom Borup, Craig Driesen, and I conducted uh, some research into 600 creative economy partnerships. We also did some work in Michigan together, including the Boyne City project that he was talking about. And so it's just really delightful that he started off the conference because I can refer to what he's talked about quite a bit. And, and that's really nice. So in terms of partnerships, many of us tend to think about partnerships in a very loose way. We use this term partnerships to mean a lot of different things. And one of the things that's very important when you're thinking about this is to understand how partnerships evolve. They don't just all of a sudden happen. All of a sudden you're working with 85 community partners in a project, or at least I hope that you're not doing that. Um, I want to ask, just for a show of hands, how many of you have partnerships in the community right now, in your communities? Okay, so the majority of you do. And um, what I want to do is talk a little bit about the kind of evolution of partnerships and the different flavors of partnerships. Many people use the term, um, they, they use an analogy of relationships to talk about partnerships. And I think that's a really good analogy to use. Because in a way, um, affiliations are kind of like dating. You don't really know the person yet. Um, you maybe have met them at a party, quite literally, a friend's party, or you met them at a Chamber of Commerce event or that kind of thing. And you realize this is a great opportunity for me to work together with the Tourism Bureau on um, uh, telling them about our festival. So when they're working with their um, uh, hospitality folks that are part of their membership, um, they can tell people who are visiting the area about our festival that's going on, and there's this kind of win-win situation. It's really easy, and affiliation means business as usual, but you're kind of integrating some new element like telling people about the festival in the context of that um, affiliation. In the case of a collaboration, you're getting a little bit more people at the table. You're, getting, you're kind of amping it up. You're starting to go steady. And you're starting to think about ways that you can um, uh, really communicate more effectively. Usually in translating this out of the, the analogy into real life and using the Tourism Bureau again as an example, is you might have um, multiple cultural organizations in a community that collaborate together and say, we really want to tell our local Tourism Bureau about this series of month-long events kind of like our October, um, that um, would be happening in our community. And we want the Tourism uh, Bureau to actually put together a brochure or put together a special promotion just about this series of month-long events. It means multiple meetings, multiple different um, partner uh, people from the uh, different uh, organizations that are coming and talking together about how to plan this kind of uh, project. And that is um, very distinct from an affiliation. It's much more intense. Um, but again, there's not a lot of merging of uh, ways that people are working together. You're not merging your staff. You're, you're not somehow coming uh, up with a, a kind of quasi-organizational structure together. You're just working on a project. You're working on something very distinct. That's a collaboration. In the case of a partnership, you're thinking about ways that you can address a broad community need and work together across sectors to address that broad community need. Many cultural organizations have done this effectively with addressing youth risk, youth at risk needs, um, uh, talking about tourism, economic development. There's lots and lots of examples of ways that cultural organizations have collaborated with other sectors in the communities to address these broader community needs. And that partnership usually involves a much more complicated set of structures and ways of communicating and finances and that sort of thing. I'll be talking about that in a minute. A merger is when two organizations actually become one. 
Um, so they are getting married now. And, um, and that way uh, is a much more complicated uh, uh, arrangement, and it's really not what we're going to be talking about in this um, context today. Uh, partnerships are very interesting because we all come from this organizational context, or most of us do, and we have these expectations about how communication is going to happen, who is in charge, how decisions are made, how finances are um, arranged amongst the various staff members, and there's a, a culture of the organization, a way that people see themselves working together as an organization that people agree upon in a single organization. When you come together in a partnership, all of that stuff is gone. You have to create a new culture together. You have to decide how decisions are going to be made. You have to figure out how money is going to be used as the partners within that group. And that requires a lot of communication and strategies for structuring those, those uh, dynamics. And it can be very challenging and very um, difficult for many communities. So before you engage in a partnership, or for those of you who are in partnerships, you want to ask yourself some key questions. You want to ask yourself, what is your enlightened self-interest in engaging in this partnership? This is, again, distinct from an affiliation or a collaboration where you're saying, why is my organization at the table? What is it that we can achieve? What, how will our mission be enhanced by this uh, work in the partnership? What is it that we are going to get out of this uh, affiliation or this partnership together? So you want to ask yourself those questions. Um, uh, other questions you want to ask yourself are, what are the assets that each organization brings to the table? Unlike a for-profit partnership, as in the case of a corporation, whoever uh, ponies up the most money actually runs the partnership. In the case of a nonprofit organizational partnership, that is community-based partnerships where you're working across sectors, that money isn't the determining factor for who's in charge. In fact, people have to decide who's in charge based on a variety of assets that they bring to the table relationships with various community sectors, uh, uh, the avail availability of facilities or space, some extra staff time that can be donated to the partnership to manage the details, and money. All of these things together can uh, constitute the assets that each partner brings to the table. And you have to know what those um, assets are and why you're at the table before you get involved. And you want to also um, figure out who's missing from the group. One of the things that's very common in partnerships is because of the way that they evolve from these affiliations to collaborations, usually with friends or colleagues that you know who have common uh, work experience and culture, you're talking about people that not, aren't necessarily um, people that you pal around with in the community that you want to be part of the partnership because those people are the right people to address the community needs that you're trying to address through your partnership. So that notion of inviting new people in is very difficult in terms of human nature, um, but also we find in, in partnership development. Um, one of the things that we found in our research is that there was this incredible correlation between organizational um, uh, theory literature and um, literature about uh, partnership development in education. In fact, some of our work involved looking back at some of the early research of the Arts Extension Service into partnership development in arts education settings. It was really fascinating how uh, common these um, theories and practices interrelated across sectors. Um, there was this person named Bruce Tuckman who came up with this concept form, norm, storm, or excuse me, form, storm, norm, and perform. And um, anybody who's familiar with this concept, uh, it talks about group dynamics in organizations. And I can see some nodding heads of people who are familiar with this theory. He found that people tended, when they came together in teams in organizations, to initially form and have a lot of disorganization about how they were going to do work together. And then they had a storm period where they actually had a lot of conflict. And many of these teams disbanded and didn't finish the work. Those that did continue their work then started 
to um, uh, normalize the workflow and then start doing the work. So his theory was actually very relevant to our research and we found the same pattern in creative economy partnerships that we studied that were cross-sector between the arts and non-arts entities and communities. The other thing that was really interesting is the UK Department of Education kind of took their own snapshot of partnerships in education and they found four stages of development in partnerships that correspond roughly to this same uh, theory that Tuckman posited. And we found that these stages corresponded to years, that is year one, year two, year three, and year four of these creative economy partnerships. It was very, very interesting to see this happen. There was a high number of drop-offs between the first and second year, and then there was a smaller number of drop-offs between the third and fourth year. And that was really pretty much the lifespan that we were looking at for many of the partnerships. Some of the best practices, and there's lots more to say about this that I can't go into today, um, are that we found that many good partnerships, community-based partnerships that were cross-sector, had a person at the center who was kind of dealing with the administrative duties of organizing meetings and making things happen and communicating the work of the partnership. We also found that there were really common, uh, a common focus on goals. They really were clear about what it is that they were trying to address, the needs that they were trying to address in the community. And that helped the, uh, the rest of the partnership to kind of come together and coalesce and form. They also often had written agreements that uh, summarized the ways in which decisions would be made. And they didn't um, uh, try to create a, an organization in itself, but to really allow all the partners a chance to speak and make decisions and share that decision-making process. Which brings me to the partnership challenges. One of the things that's very interesting is that this administrative person at the center, which often happens in these community-based partnerships, often is frustrated because their own voice is not allowed to be the decision-making authority of the partnership, which is very, very different from how organizations um, operate. A person in an organization who's a leader often has the final say on the decisions, but in the partnership context, you want to be sure that the decision-making authority is diffused across the partnership, and it's a partnership decision. And that's a very, very tough role to play. And I've had lots of conversations with people in that role, and it's extremely difficult um, to, to do and uh, something that people struggle with. Uh, financial agreements are also something that people really struggle with in partnerships. And there's lots, lots more to be said. Um, I wanted to give you a couple of resources. These two resources, the first one um, I worked on with uh, both Craig Driesen and Tom. And um, this is a workbook that uh, walks people through the steps of how to set up a creative economy partnership. The second workbook I created with Mary Margaret Schoenfeld um, and we were looking at partnerships within local arts agency contexts. And it was uh, based on research from Americans for the Arts. So it, it's really been a delight to talk with all of you today about some of the uh, highlights of this research. I'm going to turn it over now to Linda Caldwell, who's going to be talking about the Tennessee Overhill Heritage Association. Thank you. Good. So glad you're here this morning. This is great. Cultural tourism is a very different business model, and that becomes a little bit of a problem sometimes when we work with convention and visitors bureaus or chambers of commerce that tend to be membership-based and tend to provide services for members only. <clears throat> what we have found is that some of the most exciting, interesting businesses that you may have that would attract the cultural traveler may not be a part of the business establishment, may not belong to business associations, or feel a part of the business establishment. Conversely, the same thing happens with artists. There's a whole world of artists out there that operate outside the arts establishment. In fact, some of them don't even call themselves artists. I'm not gonna go over each step in this process in the interest of time, but in order to really make this process work, and let's talk particularly about identifying assets, it's important to have a lot of different kinds of people at the table and a lot of different partners. Each step in that process 
requires different partners. And I mean different kinds of people from the community, everything from artists to good old boys, and different kinds of academic disciplines, and in some cases, different kinds of agencies. There are several principles of cultural tourism that are pretty widely talked about. It's fairly common conversation nowadays in the tourism world, but I want to mention how important partnerships are for, uh, for beginning to develop those principles. Authenticity. The question is, what is authentic and who gets to decide? Preservation. We can all agree that it's important to preserve our assets, but what do we preserve? We know that we probably should preserve a fine old 1927 theater, but what about a fine old copper mine or a textile mill? So again, the question becomes, who gets to decide? Thoughtful interpretation, and this is where having lots of brains at the table and lots of different points of view can be especially important. And adhering to those principles <coughs> requires partners along the way to sort of keep us grounded in that. And this is an example. The gentleman on the right is one of our founding board members, Kenneth Dalton, an excellent basket maker and a mountain man. And his organization, community organization that he belongs to up in Coker Creek, plays a major role with the project we're working on now, which is the preservation of Fort Armistead, the first federal fort built in the <laughs> southern mountains, and an encampment during the Trail of Tears. The other partner that's important, and there are a whole lot of them, I'm just trying to show you the range, is that really good-looking man standing there with me in the picture. That's Mitchell Hitz, the uh, chief of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. I sent this photo to my daughters, emailed it, and I said, see mother, see mother with handsome man. <laughs> uh, and marketing. We, we utilize a niche marketing approach. We have identified our assets and figured out what kinds of niche markets those things fit, and then how do we get that message to those people in doing that. One of the things I had to come to grips with with the cultural tourism program or any kind of tourism program after 11 years working for an arts council is I found out that actually what I was doing was not the center of the universe and that the reality was with all of the uh, southern half of the Cherokee National Forest in our area that outdoor recreation was driving the visitation to our area. That's just the reality of it. But the downside to that is it's seasonal. And what do you do about expanding shoulder seasons or going across 12 seasons? And this is, where, this is where the arts and culture really plays a major role in our tourism development because they have things going on all year long. And the gateway communities that circle the forest, they provide business support systems as well as cultural, as well as cultural things, dining, lodging, shopping, all those things. When it comes to rural tourism, critical mass rules, which means you have to work and play well with others in, in neighboring communities. For every hour anyone travels, they expect four hours of things to see and do. One of the things we've done to combine assets, too, because we don't have enough money to individually promote our seven museums and several historic sites. So we pulled them together in a trail called the First to Factories Heritage Trail, and it tells the story of our region from the fur and hide trade in the 1700s through the coming of the, the mines and the railroads. And similarly, the Unicoi Turnpike Trail crosses into two states. That's a project we worked on, uh, thanks to Roby Cogswell, he got us into that. But anyway, we started working on that back, what, Roby, 1990? No, 98, uh, no. yeah. Anyway, but, it, but it's a 67-mile trail from Von Orr, Tennessee to Murphy, North Carolina, with several historic sites along the way. It's a thousand-year-old trail. Now, I've talked a lot about history, but I want to mention that some of our history museums are also presenters of the arts. And in, sometimes in a small town like Inglewood, Tennessee, the history may, museum may be the primary presenter of the arts. So it's very common where I live in the rural world for these things to cross over. Agritourism and art. You know, uh, several years ago, thanks to Appalachian Regional Commission, we asked uh, if we could take a look at, hire a folklorist and take a look at who is making things that relate to uh, farming, particularly culinary. Culinary tourism is one of the hottest new trends right now in the travel world. And one of the things we asked the folklorists to do was identify what the foodway traditions actually are of our region, because sometimes we think we know more about our area than we actually know. 
and in this case to, to identify those practitioners and to help us develop a section of our website that showcased that. The same thing, again, we went back to the Appalachian Regional Commission and the Conservation Fund. I believe Ann Polk was there when we were working on asset-based economic development. And we said, we'd like to take a look at, we have this big national forest. Who's making things that relate to the occupational and recreational uses of the national forest? We were so thrilled with what this folklore has found, what Liza Blair found, that we came back to the Tennessee Arts Commission and said, could we do an exhibit of, of what we learned? And they helped us do that through a cultural crossroads grant. And at the same time, I don't want to run over here, at the same time, uh, do you, you got it? <laughs> at the same time, that uh, someone called me from the National Endowment for the Arts, talk about serendipity, and said, we've got an exhibit up here at the Smithsonian that I'm aware of called Forest Inspirations. No one in Tennessee's asked for it. It's free. I said, my God, we'll take it. And, and, and we have this local exhibit. This is perfect. He said, well, we'll give you $2,000 to uh, hire an art artist to perform or add an artistic component to it. So we went back to those people, over 30 artists that were identified, that we exhibited. And this guy here was by far the big hit. We did three weekends of demonstrations. That's Russ Arthur. He's a champion turkey caller. Uh, East Tennessee Foundation has helped us recently with a project called Celebrations of Place. This is uh, Laura Priestman, and I have a couple of catalogs from that exhibit out here for display only. For over 30 years, she has made quilted wall hangings about the Tennessee Overhill, places in the Tennessee Overhill, and she writes essays and poems to go with them that are really good. So we did a retrospective exhibition of Laura's work. And it was big enough that we needed two venues at the same time. So one was your typical place you would expect. That's the Etowah Arts Commission Gallery in Etowah. But we also used the newspaper bookshop in Benton, Tennessee. We had to have two openings because everybody wanted to be the star. But, you know, it worked really well. And we actually worked on that with uh, a book club. Again, this little book club down in Polk County came to us and said, George Scarborough, he's a renowned poet. Unfortunately, died a couple of years ago. And he grew up son of a sharecropper in Polk County, Tennessee. And uh, when he was 90, the book club said, could you help us do a birthday party for him? Which we did at Benton City Hall. I thought maybe 50 people might show up to hear this old man read his poems. And we had over 100. And he was really well received. When he died, he said he didn't want to have a funeral in a church. He didn't think much of organized religion. So we had a ceremony for him with the book club and the local community there with poetry, reading, and music. We had it at the courthouse and uh, was a reception across the road with, uh, at the newspaper bookshop. Now, it's a new decade for us, and we have new partners. In 2002, we found ourselves the proud owner of a 47-mile-long railroad. The guy down there on the left in the picture, bottom left, that's young Mike Little. He's our locomotive, one of our locomotive engineers, and he's talking to a retired engineer from CSX. After we got the railroad, and we got 19 miles of it surveyed and put on the National Register of Historic Places, we worked with Polk County High School, their multimedia class, their history class, and their art class to do a documentary film on the history of the railroad. The art class designed all the covers for everything. The uh, history class worked on the research and the multimedia worked on the film. That's Linda Billman. Through our funding, we were able to hire her. She's a documentary photographer to, uh, to work with the students on documentary filmmaking skills. And here they are. Uh, the railroad donated the, the equipment and a day on the train. They're interviewing a, a retired locomotive engineer here. And the film won an award. I'm not going to talk about our federal funding partners, but I do want to mention some state funding partners that have made a great deal of difference to us. Tennessee Tourism provides matching funds every year for marketing. Tennessee Arts Commission for over 15 years has been funding something we call the Traditional Performing Arts Series. And through that, we pay for artists to perform at community events that are not sponsored by people with paid staff or that have a lot of knowledge in uh, developing or presenting the arts. And the reason we do that is twofold. Number one, we like seeing the money go in the artists' pockets, but we want to link community festival presenters and events to these artists and their local artists. 
Humanities Tennessee, we couldn't have done the Unicoi Turnpike Trail without it. They paid for research, and signage, and a lot of things. But I think if I would leave you with any one final word, I would say it's so much fun to get a lot of people together that know different things from what we know and just stay in a discovery mode. Because just about the time I think I know the assets in my area, I find out I've just scratched the surface. So thank you. Okay, we're going to switch over now to Nancy Gatovi, who's going to be talking about Central Park, North Carolina. <laughs> My name is Nancy Gatovi, and I'm the executive director of Central Park NC and also something called StarWorks Center for Creative Enterprise. And a few years ago, we took uh, over a 187,000 square foot former sock, sock factory in the big city of Star, North Carolina, population 806. No, seven. <laughs> Got a new person. Um, and uh, the, the factory closed down in 2003, moved its operations to Central America, and uh, a local business person um, approached us about taking over this building and seeing what we could do to uh, create some jobs and some new life into uh, this uh, dying little former textile town. We're a rural economic development organization, a seven, eight county, actually rural economic development organization. We're not an arts organization. And a lot of people think that StarWorks is an arts incubator of sorts. Um, we actually uh, use arts to create businesses, but we don't uh, create uh, or incubate artists per se. Um, and I think that one of the things that uh, you know has been very interesting about um, uh, our project has been that uh, you know when when the factory closed, and this was a, a kind of a a one factory town, uh, not only did it lead uh, to a, a loss of jobs and that sort of thing, but it also, uh, you know, created a loss of community. And I think that that's uh, often something that people don't think about. These large factories, this uh, building uh, housed a, a thousand folks making socks. And uh, it was a place where members of the community came together uh, in a way that uh, they really aren't those kinds of public places anymore. It's where people learned about births and deaths and you know what was happening in their community. Um, so when we took over this building, we really wanted to think about what, what could we do to not only kind of create jobs, but also to, uh, to engage members of the community again uh, in a real uh, specific sort of way, um, to create that kind of public sphere. Um, and we were also very aware that traditional economic development is, is risky. Um, you know, when this factory moved to town, to this small town, uh, after World War II, which is when a lot of manufacturing came to the South, uh, you know, they, they employed a lot of people. They employed generations of people for a long time, 50, 60 years. But that's no longer the case now. Forbes magazine did a, a uh, an interesting study a couple of years ago and showed that the average life expectancy now of a corporation is seven to 12 years. Seven to 12 years. It's because of mergers and acquisitions and breakups and, uh, you know, and so forth and so on. Uh, and also globalization. They move around. They're moving targets now. So for me, as an economic, you know, somebody working in economic development or nonprofit capacity, every time I see a newspaper article that says, you know, uh, some company has moved to one of our rural communities and, uh, you know, they're going to employ 200 people. I go, oh, great. And then I go, ugh. Because I think about what's going to happen in five years when that company's not there. I think about the folks who go out and they get credit cards and they get mortgages and they get car payments because they've got a job and then suddenly it's not there anymore. So we're, uh, we're very committed to the idea of, uh, of creating small homegrown businesses. And we use arts to do that, and we use partners uh, to, to, to do that with, with arts. Um, one of the things that's really interesting is that we find that, uh, that uh, artists have a natural affinity with all things rural. We often think of artists in very urban sort of context, but uh, artists also have an affinity for things like uh, small-scale sustainable agriculture and local food and organics and that kind of thing. Um, they're very interested in uh, small-scale manufacturing. 
we do manufacturing at Starworks. We don't make socks anymore. We make uh, kind of niche-based kinds of things. We, for example, have a company in uh, Starworks that builds uh, glass studio equipment for glass blowers for universities, primarily in art centers and that sort of thing. We also, our nonprofit organization started a small business where we, we make clay for potters. We started out uh, making clay for the local pottery community, but now we have more than 2,000 customers in six states. Um, so we're doing manufacturing. Uh, we also had a geothermal company, a biodiesel plant, uh, a variety of other sorts of things. But what we found is that artists were very, very interested and attracted uh, to Starworks because we were doing those kinds of activities. Um, this leads to some really interesting partnerships, and I think that that's uh, kind of uh, something that uh, I think a lot of arts organizations sort of don't realize what the potential is there. Um, we, for example, have, uh, we have partnerships with USDA Rural Development. Um, we have uh, Department of Labor is very interested in our work and supports us, Department of Commerce, Tourism, Universities and Colleges, Economic Development Agencies, EDA, and most recently, venture capitalists have become really interested, and this is a completely new world for me, but um, hey, why not? Um, you know who doesn't support us, actually, uh, is the uh, State Arts Council. <laughs> we have never, ever, ever been able to get uh, uh, funding of any sort. We have one of six high school glassblowing programs in the United States in the little uh, town of Starr, North Carolina. Um, we tend to, uh, well, we provide training in not only in glass blowing, but also in clay and ceramics, graphic design. We have a graphic design studio, renewable energy, small scale, sustainable, uh, uh, and organic agriculture. We teach uh, mushroom growing workshops and all manner of things. These are some of the high school kids. Um, we teach beer making, uh, beginning and advanced. Um, we don't do things the normal way. When we did a uh, bike race, for example, um, we had a lot of unicyclists. Um, a lot of uh, companies we've noticed around the country, seven years ago we started doing pie day at work. Um, everybody make a pie and bring it. And we, we noticed that this, there's a, a national pie day, but we also discovered that it was very close to uh, uh, Edgar Allan Poe's birthday, so we do actually Edgar Allan Pie Day. Uh, where we watch uh, the, the telltale heart and scare ourselves to death. Uh, we discovered that we can make popcorn in the glass studio out of the furnace, <laughs> and it's very entertaining. Um, but one of the things also is that we've realized that, uh, you know, we have to stop the hollowing out of, of kids, of young creative people in our community. We have to provide things for them to do. Uh, we have to provide meaningful community activities. Um, and so we uh, are constantly thinking of things that we can do, not as an economic development organization, but things that we can do to make our community more livable. Because the things that are good for our community residents are also good for small businesses. They attract small businesses there. Um, so we built a wood-fired pizza oven in the back, and uh, it's in the garden. Uh, we also have a CSA, a um, Community Supported Agriculture Program, um, and so we uh, often, uh, we, we, we make beer and we uh, pick stuff out of the garden and we uh, put it on a pizza and we invite the whole community uh, to come out and do that. We set things on fire around the building regularly. Uh, <laughs> our insurance agent at one point came through and I was saying, okay, so the glass studio is over here. Uh, the wood kilns are over here, the gas kilns, electric kilns are over here, the biodiesel plants are over here. Oh, and we're putting in a, a, an iron furnace back here. And he said, Nancy, are you ever going to do anything that doesn't involve fire? And I thought, no, no. In fact, actually, we just got a, a National Endowment for the Arts uh, grant uh, to do something, a three-day fire festival in the spring, uh, where we're going to do in-situ fired sculpture and, well, set more stuff on fire. <laughs> We're, uh, we profoundly uh, believe that diversity is really important in, in our communities to make all of this work, to make our communities really attractive. Um, we have managed to uh, bring people from all over the United States and actually from around the world to come to work at Starworks. Um, and uh, so diversity for us is really, really key. It makes it an exciting place uh, to live. 
both for the folks at Starworks as well as in the local communities. Um, and uh, and it just makes things very interesting. We believe in uh, bipedal as well as quadrupedal diversity. Uh, that's Louise, the wet dog, the wet dog glass mascot. Um, this is actually an interesting couple. This is a couple who, uh, who uh, relocated from New Orleans uh, after Katrina to Star. And I had a lot of uh, the Department of Commerce, they, they do manufacturing, They're, they manufacture glass studio equipment, all, they ship it all over the world, they're doing major exports and stuff now. They, uh, small business, they have about 15 employees, and had Department of Commerce that came down and said, Nancy, what did you do, you know, to, to incentivize, you know, this company to move to Star? And I said, well, it was above sea level. <laughs> that was enough. Um, this is Adam Landman, and uh, I, I often, when I, when I talk about how uh, communities that are interested in using arts to do economic development really need to think about how uh, open-minded that they are. Because when you bring, when you think that you want artists to come to your community, uh, they might look a little bit differently than a lot of the other folks in your community. And I, uh, I wonder sometimes what people would do if this fellow came in to their office looking for a job. Now, this guy did. His name's Adam Lamb, and he came in. Actually, he came as an intern in ceramics, but he's a former Marine. Um, he's also an uh, awesome staff development person. Um, he can fix anything that you put in front of him. And he can take 400 at-risk kids and get them lined up and quiet in 90 seconds flat. <laughs> so uh, that's the back of our very ugly building. Um, but here's the, the, what I call the serious stuff. And I think that it's really important that, uh, that um, arts people not be afraid of data. Um, I don't know why, but sometimes they seem to be a little bit averse to it. Um, since we have started this in 2000. Five, roughly, we have invested $5.3 million in this little community. Um, we've generated, the, the companies, the small businesses in there have generated $3.8 million. Uh, and that's uh, about, that's annually, I might add. Uh, we've created 57 jobs. We have tons of high school kids that go through there. Lots of visitors, and this really cracks me up because we're not a tourism destination. We just have people show up on our door that say, can, can we come in and tour around? And I go, well, you know, this is a factory and we've, it's just businesses and stuff in here. And they say, yeah, but we want to see. Um, we have average wages at Starworks well above uh, what the state average and certainly the county average is. Um, and, um, and that is with uh, more than half the people being employed there uh, are people who are artists or who have arts backgrounds that are working in manufacturing. Um, and we're one of the largest property taxpayers in the, in the county, which a lot of people are very surprised at because we're a nonprofit organization. But we do pay, we pay taxes. So uh, that was uh, my PowerPoint presentation. This, this building was such an important part of the local community. It was a school for a long time. It was uh, a manufacturing place and employed a lot of people. In fact, you're really hard pressed to go around this county, around this region and find somebody who hasn't spent some portion of their lives either going to school or working in this building. And so when the company, uh, it was a sock factory, moved their operations to Central America, you know, it was really devastating to this small community. Um, Star has a population of 800. Uh, there were more than a thousand people employed in this building at one point, so it was it was really quite devastating. So we took over the building. That's 187,000 square feet. It's four acres of building under roof. Nearby, near Star, was the community of Seagrove, where there were over 100 pottery studios, and uh, they were mostly importing all of their clay materials. But there was a very big interest in 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 making pots from local materials. And so um, we saw that as, a, as an opportunity for a small business. So we um, were fortunate to find a, a real talented uh, clay maker, Takara Shibata, who came here from Japan and uh, started, making, uh, started growing this business. We actually got access to the historic Seagrove clay pit. 
and uh, we are now making a Seagrove clay body for the first time in decades. Um, the clay business is growing really well. We've got more than 2,000 customers. We sell clay in six states now. And then uh, we started looking at other things that we could do here, and we got interested in starting um, a, a glass studio. The trend now is uh, public access glass studios. In other words, one big glass studio where uh, individual glass artists can come in and rent that studio by the hour. We started looking around for someone that could help us do that, and we were, uh, after calling all over the country, we were uh, directed to uh, Eddie Bernard, the owner of Wet Dog Glass. Wet Dog Glass had pretty much been wiped out uh, in Katrina. Their, their fab shop, their fabrication place was uh, in Midtown New Orleans and was underwater. They really liked what we were trying to do here at Starworks and um, decided that they wanted to move here too. So as soon as they unloaded all their equipment for the most part, they got the largest contract that they had ever had. With the glass studio, uh, now we have kind of a co-working arrangement where uh, the public access glass studio is a space where glass artists can come from uh, all over North Carolina as well as other places and they can share that all the equipment and all that space uh, it's a great opportunity for them it's it makes glass blowing affordable again but it also provides us the opportunity to have a glass studio to provide glass instruction so we have one of six high school glass blowing programs in the United States starting actually in January we'll be bringing artists from all over the world here to do uh, extended glass residencies here we uh, do uh, tons of children's programs through here uh, last month in July we had 400 kids when you do things to your community to attract small businesses it's also good for your people who live there we uh, are looking at developing a brewery here on site Starworks is, is a part community development, part economic development, part arts project, part all kinds of stuff. But all of it is, uh, is about uh, regrowing the local economy and the local community in this small town. Our final speaker is Craig Hoover, and Craig is going to be um, talking a little bit about his work in uh, communities, in a variety of communities, as a arts consultant. So, Craig, you're up next, and we'll wrap it up. Thank you. I'll tell you what, it might be uh, 808 residents at Star here pretty soon. <laughs> Beer, glass. Good, thanks. Uh, Sounds awesome. Uh, now, my name is Craig Hoover. Uh, I have a consulting firm called Your Town Performs. Um, and uh, I, uh, I do creative placemaking. Um, and uh, Tom today uh, gave basically my whole, uh, my whole presentation, so I'm just going to skip to the end. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, no uh, Tom and I are definitely drinking the same Kool-Aid. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll go through this, and I'm going to go sort of off script a little bit based on what, you know, what, we've, uh, what we've been talking about today. Um, but I will say, you know, in terms of STAR, you know, you, you've got people knocking on your door, and that's exactly the phenomenon that, uh, that you want, right? And so now it's time to go say, all right, private developers, maybe there needs to be a, uh, a mixed-use component to this, to this development. And we've got, we get people moving in, get businesses moving in, and there's actually a retail component. So that's the kind of thing that I do. Which is, uh, um, well, okay, here we go. Uh, anyway, I, I started in Seaside, Florida. Have you guys ever been to Seaside, Florida? Um, I started the theater company there back um, in my early 20s and, uh, um, and then realized what that was doing to, uh, sort of to attract you know, tourists and you know, day shoppers and things like that. And then, uh, we then started working with their Merchants Association, which, is, which had historically been, uh, you know, cleaning up the streets, putting in nice planters, you know, that kind of thing. But they had a, uh, you know, 1%, a 1% tax that went on to every, every purchase that happened in, uh, in Seaside, went into this Merchants, Merchants Association. And, um, and so I worked with them to make it be more of a, uh, you know, to incorporate arts and culture and make it more, be more of a presenting organization, where it was sort of making arts and culture be a driver. So then all of a sudden, uh, you saw that that 1% was getting a lot bigger because the more arts and cultural events 
were going on at Seaside, the more uh, the more people were shopping in the shops, and the more the uh, um, the more the, the real estate values increased, and uh, everything rose. The, the tide rose together, and, and arts and culture is the uh, is the catalyst for that. Um, and then I, I started getting into mixed use development, um, you know, in the private sector because. I said, wait a minute, I think I might have this little secret sauce that makes, uh, that makes a, a real estate, uh, makes a mixed use environment tick. And, uh, um, and so I was helping uh, private developers all over the North America who have these retail districts that needed you know, a, a defibrillator, right? And so arts and culture can be that, uh, that, that electric shock that brings people to the community, that enlivens a community that what we call, I call it activation. You know, it's, and it's project activation, and that's what and that's what we would do. Um, so let's see. Uh, so you know, these are you know some of the places that uh, um, where I've gone in and uh, and worked. Um, and essentially, and 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 Ann Markison and the NEA, they kind of came up with this uh, you know creative place making moniker, and it was oh, I like it. You know, and and it's essentially that's what this is. I mean, it's it's about cross sector partners. Uh, shaping the physical and social um, character of a neighborhood, a town, a city, a district, um, you know, through the arts. And it has been, it, it is, you know, Tom mentioned it this morning, it being such a, uh, a serious wave of, uh, of, of, of momentum that's, that's coming with creative placemaking. I'm, I'm right now in the process of writing a white paper for Nashville's general plan for how they, uh, for the uh, for arts and culture and how that's incorporated, and I'm finding a lot of scope creep, and that's what partnerships are, is all about. You know, it's, it's uh, the more I start writing about, you know, how arts and culture can, can integrate into the plan of Nashville, I'm finding that, you know, well, now I've got to get into land use policy, and now I've got to get into arts education policy, and now we've got to get into uh, um, to, uh, entrepreneurship and small business incubation and things like that, because it, it's all integrated. and. Uh, and I think what we're finding here is, is there is no separation now between place and culture. Place is just a manifestation of culture. Uh, it's the physical manifestation of culture. And that is, and that's what uh, is an exciting thing about the arts right now. Um, you know, we can stop apologizing for being artists, right? We can stop, you know, begging for money. We can go in there and with our head held heads held high and say, uh, we are integral to, uh, to the success of any place. You have to have an architectural uh, identity to succeed in this, uh, in this new world. I mean, if you, uh, you know, read that stuff, if you're with an arts organization, and certainly if you're with a, uh, um, a municipality or, uh, or a business improvement district, read the work on creative placemaking. Read Ann Markison's work. Read uh, Richard Florida's work, it, uh, um, it's just happening, okay? This is a cultural shift. Uh, we are not, um, and you know, uh, Tom mentioned it this morning, um, people, are, people are more attached to their place than ever before. They're buying more locally, they are travel. they're commuting less, and so it's more and more important uh, to, to create a, a civic, identity that is based on arts and culture. And, and real estate professionals, the real estate developers and, uh, and, and city officials are starting to recognize this. And so now we can, like I say, stop apologizing for, for wanting to work, wanting to do art, okay? Start saying that, you know, by God, you need me and uh, let me in. <laughs> um, you know, these are just a few and you can look these up. You know, Tom talked a little bit, Paducah, Kentucky, uh, Arnoville, uh, um, Louisiana is another, you know, population of, you know, 1,400 people, uh, you know, just realize that they had this great multicultural uh, um, entertainment, uh, um, you know, group of artists, and so they start this whole entertainment, this, this big, this small business creative entrepreneurship uh, uh, incubator, and they partnered with a non-traditional school, and now it is this place where people are flocking, and there's this ink migration of artists, property values are skyrocketing, and this is what, this is what towns and people need, right? And this is what, uh, of all sides. In Sitka, Alaska, this is a similar situation to, to the Star. 
uh, North Carolina, this was a, a, uh, a university that just went bankrupt, unfortunately. Um, but that means they had a big campus. And they changed this campus into a fine arts camp. Uh, they moved a fine arts camp in there. Now there's year-round artistic activity, and now tourists are flocking in. It's part of the normal uh, tour. And, uh, and this, was, this is a great example of creative placement. So I'm, I'm essing a lot. So what you got to have, you have to have artistic activity, you have to have private support, and you have to have uh, political will. Okay, And all that is starting to happen. Um, but you need to go uh, you read about creative placemaking so you can speak the language um, uh, to, to, the, to the municipalities, to the private sector, and, and if you are one of those two, so you can speak to the artists to find out what they need. Um, these are the types of, uh, of partnerships that, that I've helped develop and I've seen you know, be fruitful. Obviously, this is very broad, and, uh, and, and I wish there was a, you know, some kind of uh, magic template or formula I could give you guys to say, you know, uh, th this type of partnership works. Um, it's completely contextual, um, but we know that you know, the, the particular outcomes of, of you know, uh, civic pride of place, of uh, real estate values, of uh, artists uh, in migration um, and, uh, and, artists, and arts participation. These are all the outcomes you're trying to get to, and they all have benefit, and they all, have, they all rise, raise everyone's tide. Right? Um, look, governments want to increase their tax rolls. Businesses want more exposure to customers. Real estate professionals want, uh, or developers want a return on investment, and artists just want to work. I mean, this is all very intuitive, but it's something we should, you know, you know, it's a mantra that we should say to ourselves when we're starting to build partnerships. This is the, this is the, the, the bare essentials of what uh, partnerships are. Um, you know, these are some, some initiatives that have proven to work, you know, these, uh, these cultural districts. If you've got a downtown, if you're a municipality or you, if you're an arts organization within a small, uh, you know, town that has any sort of, of, uh, of retail cluster, I implore you to form a business improvement district. Um, if you're an arts council, partner with that business improvement district once they're formed and, uh, and create a, a revenue stream. Um, as state and federal funding for uh, arts organizations begins, is decreasing, just due to, you know, it's not there, uh, um, you've got to rely on local businesses. And there is a very tangible uh, data that you can show that, that these, these type of things really work, these business improvement districts work, and they create opportunities for artists, and they, they create opportunities for customers, and they create opportunities for real estate investment. Um, and people are want to go to your downtown, believe it or not. They, they do want to go to your downtown, and they want to be proud of your downtown because that is the physical, physical manifestation of the culture of your place. Oh, I understand that. Um, arts education, after school programs, uh, you know, I think we're, we're, we all know what those can do. We talked about Paducah and what their uh, artist housing and live work uh, developments are doing. And then the last one is, is the most important, um, I think, is creative entrepreneurial support. Um, you know, partner with local businesses. Partner with uh, your uh, economic development uh, um, organization or your CBB to create opportunities for artists to, uh, to market their products. And by market, I don't just mean uh, advertise. I mean bring their products to market, uh, where people can consume them, or watch them, or buy them, or whatever that, me whatever that means to that particular artist. Uh, often they need help figuring out the business model for how that works. And, uh, and, and, and so it, and the private sector is generally uh, amenable to that type of thing, but you've just got to, you just got to get there and get their attention and make them, uh, and make them start listening. Um, you know, this is just one. I, I want to go. This is one festival we did down in Seaside. It was so simple that you know we just businesses paid $150, you know, to sponsor an artist to decorate a parking space with chalk. Okay, and uh, and then. We got a local band to play, some food vendors to set up, and uh, um, called it Via Calori. And uh, um, you know, and five years later, you know, we were getting you know three, four thousand people to this thing, you know, every year. And it cost nothing. It was so simple, 
but these are the type of partnerships you have to partner with the business, you have to partner with the with the uh, merchant association, and you have to partner with schools and and uh, and artists to make this all happen. And it doesn't have to be sidewalk chalk; it could be public art, it could be pumpkin decorating. You know, it, it's just it just creates tourism. It creates a sense of vi of, of uh, retail viability. People walk around saying, "Gosh, I could open a store here because look at all these people walking around. They might see my stuff." Um, these are the key, so what I, I, I say the keys, you've got to have a local champion. Whenever I go into work with cities or arts councils, I find a local champion, somebody that will drive this bus when I'm gone. You've got to have somebody with a lot of energy and a lot of uh, um, you know, stick to uh, to make to make this thing happen. Um, you can train them, but, they, but you, they've got to have the fire. Um, Secondly, uh, shoot for the moon. You know, uh, your partners that you're looking for are busy people. They've got their own stuff going on. So uh, unless you can talk about some big, big impacts, they're not going to pay that much attention. So shoot for the moon. Wherever you land, it's probably OK, but just shoot for the moon. And then project and collect data. You know, project what this is going to be. You know, how many people are going to come? How, what, what's property value is going to do over 20 years? Project that stuff and collect it obsessively. I know it's not something that's, that's very fun and sexy, but uh, it's, it's critical to proving the success of your work. And then finally, uh, you got to finish. You know, a lot of great ideas are uh, stuck in the someday maybe pile. And, uh, and, and, uh, and a lot of great ideas get all the way to, uh, um, you know, let's do it, and then everyone cowers and says, okay, you do it, and, and the diffusion of responsibility takes over. So you've got to finish. Um, these are some additional resources. Uh, you know, Tom's book's on there. Uh, creative placemaking, that's the, that's the, uh, the white paper that Ann Marcus and Ann Gabwa uh, published for the NEA. Art Place is the creative placemaking sort of grant mechanism for the NEA. Uh, hopefully you all uh, know about this. If you don't, get on it. It's very important and they're, and they're, they're giving out, away a lot of money. Um, the Reinvestment Fund is a really cool uh, program in uh, Philadelphia and Baltimore, that, that sort of Atlantic area. Um, they're doing some really cool stuff, uh, rehabbing old buildings. Uh, Your Town Performs, that is a shameless plug for me. Uh, so if, you, if you'd like for me to come help you, I, I, can, I can help, um, often for a fee. Uh, the, uh, and then the Project for Public Spaces is something that is a, uh, it's kind of a place-making organization and they do some really great stuff. It's not all about arts and culture, but place-making is, 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 uh, is a holistic approach, and, uh, but arts and culture are critical to it. Um, like I said, everything's contextual, so I look forward to hearing your questions and concerns about what, you know, what kind of partnerships you're dealing with and, uh, and hopefully we've got some time. I went a little over. Thanks. Thanks. Um, before I open this up to questions, I just wanted to um, say a few thoughts about um, how these different threads came together. And it was really a delight to meet with all of you um, and get to know you on the phone before we had this panel discussion. We had some really lively discussion about what everybody's doing. Shannon put us together, and so none of us knew each other. Well, two of you knew each other, but uh, the rest of us didn't know each other, and it was really nice for us to have this opportunity. Um, I just want to tie this back to the partnership continuum. You saw a couple of examples. Linda and Nancy talked about very advanced partnerships. Craig talked about very simple partnerships like the Sidewalk Chalk Festival, all the way to very sophisticated partnerships. Um, within that partnership continuum. So um, as you reflect on that, think about the complexity of these things and that they evolve over time. So they don't just come um, out of a box. You know, you really, you really have to work on them. Some of the goals that were expressed that were addressed through these partnerships included how do we deal with the shoulder season when there really isn't a lot of tourists that are coming um, in months when the um, national forest is not as well visited. Um, how do we restore a, a sense of pride in a community when the business that it relied on, the sock factory, closes? How do you restore that sense of, of um, a, a feeling of uh, community pride and uh, how do you build the businesses back? In terms of the diversity of partnerships, one of the things that Tom talked about in his presentation was finding synergies across sectors, and this is certainly the point of this session, was to really think about the ways in which the partnerships can be so incredibly diverse that you're working with and you really want to think outside of the box and think about these goals. And then also 
Um, thinking about the enlightened self-interest, what's in it for me? The real estate professionals want to see an increase, as Craig said, in the value of the real estate that they invest in. That's just one of the many um, what's in it for me questions that people will have around the table, and it's your responsibility to understand that. Um, evaluation is something that um, uh, Nancy talked a little bit about and Craig talked a little bit about. This is a really big issue in our field. We are, we are not very good at evaluating and collecting data to support the work that we're doing. And there's some really great resources about that. If anybody's interested, I can tell you after the session is over. So I wanted to just open it up to your questions of the different panelists and uh, find out if you had anything that you'd like to ask them. And I think that this microphone moves. Thank you all so much for your presentations. Um, my name is Blair Bodine. I'm the Director of Education and Community Engagement at the Nashville Symphony. And we have a partnership that's been in place for, we're in our sixth year, and there are three partners uh, involved in an after-school program that we run. And my question is not so much about forming partnerships, but about sustaining them. We're at an interesting point where the players are, are the partners are all the same, but the players are almost entirely different of the seven or eight staff members that are involved in the partnership, maybe only one or two of them were there when the partnership was conceived. Um, so many of us probably go through similar situations where we maybe inherit, inherit, inherit? Yeah, inherit partnerships. Um, so how do we not necessarily innovate partnerships, but renovate them and sustain them um, when some of the players have changed? Yes, we love. <laughs> um, do, why don't I address this from a um, theoretical perspective and some of the research that was done? Um, I just want to say one of the things that we found um, with the research that we did is that having structures in place like written agreements. Um, was very, very important when you have this kind of transition. Because when you're talking about a partnership, again, you're talking about an organizational relationship rather than individuals. And while it's really nice to think that people will be involved with a partnership for 20 years or something, that's just not the, the situation in most communities. So having these kind of um, methods for continuity is really important. Do you have some other thoughts that you want to add? Not really, other than... Uh just to build on what Marin said, the, we just entered a five-year cooperative agreement with the National Park Service to do all things Trail of Tears, and that is on paper, and that, that will translate to whoever is, is working with the, with the uh, Park Service. But on the other hand, some of the relationships that we have in partnerships with communities and, and other people has been pretty reliant on personalities, and I think that is fragile, but that's just been the reality of you know, is just folks just kind of met, got along, liked each other. But I do think that it's a little bit scary when you think about it for the long term. Our partnerships are very fluid, and uh, and I, I, we really don't rely on any one particular partner. And we have lots of different programs, and we uh, constantly, uh, pretty much every year, if not every six months or so, go to our partners and say, hey, we've got a new idea of something that we want to try. And uh, we get them engaged in it. And so, you know, their, their staff changes all the time. Um, our staff doesn't change so much, but, um, but we're constantly doing uh, different programs. I think I drive our staff pretty much insane, I think, um, you know, coming up with different, uh, different ideas. Because, you know, the, our, our mission is to, to to breathe life in, into these communities. And to do that, you just have to be constantly trying new things. So, so we're, always, we're always talking to, to our partners, and we're always trying to expand them. As I mentioned, um, we're, we're working with an investor circle uh, group now, which is kind of interesting to me. It's something I've never done. But what's also interesting about it is that they're all people who represent a lot of different businesses. So you know, so I'm, I'm looking ahead of the, just the investor circle. and and thinking, oh, that guy's with Red Hat, you know, in Raleigh. And, you know, I wonder if I can get Red Hat and interested in some part of that. Yeah. Um, now, I would say it's, uh, 
I would echo what Mar Marin said. It's it's all about writing it down. You know, you, you, when you have a partnership, it's a new organism, and new organisms have to have purposes, and you, so you have to have a clear mission, and uh, and you have to have clear roles and responsibilities, and uh, and so you've got to write that down so they translate when new uh, new actors come in to come into play. Uh, um, yeah, write it down. You know, just to follow up to that question, um, we not only deal with uh, local industry and, and, and investors, but we also deal with political structure. And you have um, turnover and then you don't. And um, if you have to build the political will, which doesn't happen overnight, how do you do that, um, you know, to, to gain sustainability? Because we, we have areas in our rural arts organization where um, we have a lot of political support, but then there are some key people who just, they don't understand. So how, how do you keep that communication open and how do you make the government your friend and not your adversary? Uh, know your term limits. Um, you know, <laughs> the, the money is usually there at the beginning of the term and not there at the end. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and and so and so is uh, is the political will. You know, people. Uh, um, uh, you know, if, if it's an elected official, then uh, then or, or if it's an appointed official, you know, uh, their careers are always on the line. So uh, so you have to uh, take advantage when they are agenda heavy, uh, right after they've been elected or appointed, and then uh, and then and then just kind of. Uh, Sort of just get into the corner when there uh, when there when there's about to be a potential changing of the guard. Um, that would be my uh, sort of timing uh, answer to that. You know, political will. If you're able to speak the language, like I like I talked about, um, is uh, you know you can get hot buttons that uh, that get people excited and, and get people want you know thinking that they can talk to their electorate in in the right way, which is uh, about economic development. It's about uh, um, you know, creating a great place and, you know, and, and uh, making our neighborhoods better. Uh, and that's, that's what arts and culture is all about and what it will be for the next 25 years. We have amazing bipartisan support. I'm always actually kind of shocked because I think sometimes we do just the craziest stuff. And, and I always think that a lot of these conservative politicians and stuff must totally not get us. But... Um, I think because we're also, um, as I mentioned, we believe in data. And I think one of the uh, uh, things that's been most surprising to me is that, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's a double-edged sword to, to arts organizations because arts organizations typically don't get a whole lot of money. And I work with the Department of Commerce, I work with economic developers all the time, and they dump tons of money into incentives, right, to grow businesses and communities and stuff. And they have, uh, you know, they have their failures. So they're not afraid, they're not afraid of those numbers. But arts organizations, uh, it's kind of interesting, they don't get a lot of money. There's not a lot of money often put into to, uh, communities. Yet, we find that when you start actually trying to collect the economic impact data of that little bit of money that is put into arts communities, it's really pretty surprisingly good. So arts organizations, I think, uh, really, really undercut themselves when they don't start collecting some kind of data to show the economic impact. And that attracts politicians like flies. You know, they love to, to, to show uh, uh, where uh, public money has gone to do something good. And what I think that you'll find more often than not is that you'll say, well, we didn't get very much money. But here's what happened, and, and here was the economic impact. And you can contrast that and be shameless about it. You can contrast that with the huge piles of economic development money that go into some communities, especially some of our rural communities, where nothing happens. Um, and and uh, so I, we're, we're shameless about doing that, and I'm, I'm fiercely proud of it. I don't care. Well, I deal with three counties. And I've forgotten how many municipalities, so there's constant changes in terms of the political structure. And then, of course, there's the state and federal as well. So I don't have just a one-pat answer because they're, they're people and they're, 
their personalities change, and I do think, as you said, there are certain hot button issues that they respond to. One of the things I've learned, though, uh, is you know, language and vocabulary counts. What Nancy talks about with ROI does count. And I think if you look at your budget and you say, well, you gave us, a, oh, I don't know, let's say $10,000 last year, our total budget was $120,000. One thing I found that's been effective is to just make a chart that's a piece of pie that shows them where your money's coming from. And then when they realize how much money you have leveraged from that local money, I think sometimes that does make a difference. But what I find is that diff different mayors, you know, they have different personalities. The mayor that really produced the money and got the gym theater purchased for Etowah has never been in it. He couldn't care less about art. I, I just told him I thought somebody else was going to get one. <laughs> And he didn't want to be outdone. <laughs> um, I, I just want to do a little uh, show of hands in the room. How many of you feel like you have a really good relationship with your local politicians? Could you just raise your hands? I'm, I'm, the reason I'm asking that is because I'd like you to keep your hands up. Look around the room and see if you would like to have a better relationship with your local politician. Go look at these folks and maybe grab them on, on a break and say, you know, could you tell me about those, those relationships a little bit? I think that might be really useful to all of you. And I think you were next up. Yeah, I th some of my questions answered, so I want to rejigger this a little bit. And Nancy, you, um, you know, we all want to, um, I'm going to write a book one day that is enough about you, now back to me. And, uh, but your, your comment that you were, you've been funded by a lot of different people, but not your state arts agency, you know, got me, piqued my interest a little bit. And I'm good. And I'm curious, <laughs> not sure, everybody's shaking their heads. But the thing about it is, is, you know, I want to know why, but some of it, of course, I'm sure you don't fit in a box. Bingo. And you and Linda have made a career out of not fitting in a box, but, you know, much of what we do is siloed. And I, I really um, have spent a lot of my career, you know, focusing on community-driven economic development. But the tougher question for me is, from your standpoint, what do state, what can we add to that that, that helps you do what you do nationally to not, you know, to, to, to fund in rural communities, the successes I've seen are those that don't fit in a box. Mm -hmm. That, like Linda says, you know, it's a little bit of history. It's working with the park service. It's working with the economic development types. It's working, it's not really an arts project, so to speak. Yeah. So what, what can we do that we're obviously, in both of your cases, that can help you but do what we need to do, which is we've got to have return on invest, investment um, information to justify our funding as well. God Almighty, when the Department of Commerce is more creative about finding ways to fund arts organizations than the State Arts Council is, that is really interesting. Um, and. Um, to be honest, uh, a couple of years ago, we made the decision just to quit going to the Arts Council for funding. We just stopped. It just, we didn't have time and it never worked. And, uh, and, and I think the biggest, the biggest problem was that they, they, uh, I, I totally understand what the, the issue is. They want to fund artists. So, uh, for example, uh, the last time we applied to the State Arts Council for it, and, and they have tiny little uh, grant programs, quite frankly, and um, you know most of our grants are six figures and up, and um, so you know most of their grants would be like three or five thousand dollars or something like that for a thing. But we thought, okay, well, we're going to do uh, this uh, this high school glass blowing program. We started it about four years ago. And we thought, well, it would be really sweet if, uh, you know, if the Arts Council would put in three or four thousand dollars or whatever to help us do this. So I'll tell you what exactly happened. We got turned down. I called them up and I said, why? You know, why? And they said, well, we had a problem with your, with your, with your artists. We at Starworks actually hire glass artists to teach glass blowing. Yeah, we do. 
and we pay them a salary mm -hmm, with benefits like health insurance and retirement. And they said, well, we don't see your glass blowers there as artists because they have jobs. <laughs> and I said, uh, and, and, and to, to, to their credit, the program officer actually was, said to me, uh, you know, we, we really want to do this, but it just doesn't fit in our uh, thing because of the way that we define artists, you know. Is there anything that you can do, Nancy? I mean, could you put them on contract or something like that? And I said, I am not going to take away a salaried position for this person and benefits so that I can get a three to $5,000 grant from the Arts Council. I'm sorry, we hire artists and we pay them salaries. And I still think they're artists. I don't have a problem with that. And I'm sorry, you guys do, you know. We, we, we really, 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 really support our Arts Council. I don't wanna, I don't wanna sound like, uh, you know, like I, I don't think that they're doing good work. I do. I really do. Um, it's just that we're, uh, we don't do things uh, uh, like other arts organizations do. We're not an arts organization. Um, so we, we don't do things exactly the same way. And because of that, we just don't fit in those programs. But I still find it supremely ironic that, uh, that the Arts Council and, uh, you know, some other arts funders have a hard time looking at the, the end result and figuring and, and can't seem to figure out how to help us do what we're doing. And that's the part that, that is really, really frustrating uh, for me. So I guess the answer, you know, to, to, to answer the question of how can arts, how can arts organizations, how can arts funders uh, work with, uh, you know, non-arts kinds of organizations better. I, th I think that uh, probably the easiest way to do it would be to set up some kind of a uh, program uh, that uh, gets to the end result, you know, that al allows uh, people to define uh, their, their program of work a little bit differently than regular arts organizations do. I don't know, Linda? Well, of course, the Tennessee Arts Commission and our State Humanities Council have been very integral to our success, but I will say that sometimes one of the frustrations we see with the local groups we work with and, and with us too is that, is that line between the arts and humanities. You know, sometimes there's this really great idea of something to do in the community, but it doesn't really fit art because there's too much humanities in it. It doesn't really fit humanities because there's too much art in it. And, uh, maybe some work with, you know, a sister agency or something like that to uh, find a way to, to plug that hole might be worth thinking about. And of course, that has, uh, that probably has all kinds of implications in terms of what you can and can't do legally with your money or with what, uh, say, the Humanities Tennessee receives. But uh, like uh, Nancy, in addition to help from the Tennessee Arts Commission, we did a, an original play and the oral histories and everything that led up to it with money from USDA Rural Development. We'd already done some work with them that was actually an economic impact study, mm -hmm. so they knew we actually were real people and we really were interested in the uh, interested in economic development, and I think they were felt a little more comfortable doing this when we made the case that this would be helpful to this uh, particular community. The uh, African American Gospel Explosion Project that we did was actually funded by the USDA Forest Service because they wanted to work with minority communities, but they thought the minority communities ought to come out to the forest and work with them. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, actually, I don't think they're going to do that. I think you're going to have to find a way to go into the place that they live and worship and work there. And so they did it sort of as a way really to build a partnership. It ended up being very good artistically. It made our grants officer in Atlanta extremely nervous. He said to me, I do not want to look up, Linda, on 60 Minutes and see myself being interviewed about this. So it better work. <laughs> you know. But um, 
I do think I do think where these lines blur. Uh, one of the things I have found, but state to state with agencies, I think the arts agencies work really well with the arts agencies in other states. We saw that with the Cherokee Heritage Project, with the North Carolina Arts Council and the Tennessee Arts Commission. Where I find the most difficult to work across state lines, and it's very frustrating for me because I'm we're border two state lines, is state tourism offices. They talk to us all the time about working and playing well with others and the advance, advantages of regionalism, but try to get them to market something across the line, like their Unicoi Turnpike Trail, and it's nigh on to impossible. I don't know why that is. I want to make a plug for USDA and, and uh, also USDA Rural Development. They fund tons of uh, all kinds of stuff. And my experience has been that we, we give them a project and they literally, they scratch their heads and they try to figure out how to fund it. That's nice. That's, I've seen that happen in other states too. So it's really a wonderful source of revenue. I want to thank all of you for coming today. We're actually out of time. And um, I want to thank all of our speakers. They were just terrific for me to hear, and um, thank you for, for coming. <laughs> <laughs>